so much, Jason. Thanks, everybody, for joining us. That apologies, I'm a little sick, so my voice goes in and out. But we're here for the second panel of the day, which is on identity and genre. I'm going to be moderating the panel. I'm Joe Belli. I'm the associate professor of English here at City Tech. I teach uh, the science fiction course regularly. Um, and I'm really excited to introduce our presenters. I just want to ask folks to please keep your questions and comments until after <coughs> all folks have finished speaking. We'll take time for discussion at the end. And I'll introduce each person separately. So our so, first. Can I mention just one thing that most of my, uh, these are students from uh, English 1101. Yeah. The class begins at 1115, so some of them will have to leave just to. Well, we're glad you can join us for uh, all the pressures that I'm going to say So Anastasia Klimchinskaya who's going to be presenting Frankenstein or the Modern Fantastic, Rationalizing Wonder and the Books of Science Fiction. And just to share a little bit about her while she gets set up, Anastasia is a doctoral candidate at the University of Pennsylvania. She's currently working on a dissertation on the emergence of science fiction in the 19th century, which she situates in the context of earlier genres, as well as the period's discourses around scientific and technological novelty. Her other intellectual interests include the mechanisms through which science fiction becomes science fact, literature as political engagement, and the cultural history of artificial intelligence. And she's also on the organizing committee of the Philadelphia Science Fiction Conference, which is Philcom. So thanks, Anastasia. Great. Thank you for having me. Um, I'm really excited to be here in part because uh, one of my mentors and the reason that I decided to study science fiction, Dr. Eric Rockin, is sitting over there, so, you know. No pressure. <laughs> so I wanted to start with a phrase that's likely known to many of you. Uh, any uh, sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Uh, referred to as the third law of science fiction uh, by author and luminary Arthur C. Clarke, has today become common knowledge among readers of science fiction. And significantly, this law posits the magical and the technological not as irreconcilable opposites, but rather as a matter of perspective defined relative to a society's level of scientific and technological development. And though Clark likely did not know it, it also aptly summarizes the formal foundation of science fiction and hints at the reasons for its emergence at a particular techno-scientific moment. And in suggesting the relationship between magic and technology, Clark's statement gestures at the way that both are able to create a sense of wonder and, consequently, an effect of estrangement. This effect, as seminal science fiction critic Darko Subin notes, lies at the foundation of science fiction and its literary siblings of fairy tale, myth, and fantasy. As he writes, representation which estranges is one which allows us to recognize its subject, but at the same time makes it seem unfamiliar. All of these genres depict worlds that, through either magical or technological means, have a different set of laws, norms, and possibilities. And it is this difference that creates wonder, while also estranging, that is, making strange, that which we find familiar through a process of comparison. What differentiates these genres is the form of that estrangement. While they all create that same effect, it is only science fiction that creates an effect of what he terms cognitive estrangement. That is, the alternate possibilities of science fiction's strikingly different worlds are contingent, dependent upon a variety of variables, and rationally explicable, and consequently, subject to what Suver terms a cognitive glance. Meanwhile, in the worlds of myth, fantasy, and fairy tale, these magical possibilities simply are. They're fixed, and changing, inexplicable. We might therefore visualize students' categories of estrangement um, in the following way as a chart. However, what this classification implies is atemporality, as it assumes the basic stability of these categories. Clark's statement, by contrast, suggests a temporal perspective through which magic can transform into technology. And following his lead, I want to suggest historicizing, that is, temporalizing, students' categorization. I therefore want to trace the way that cognitive estrangement emerged out of non-cognitive estrangement in the 19th century and developed by staging and interrogating cognition to eventually create science fiction. And this process of literary evolution, 
parallels and reflects the experience of technology in the 19th century, as well as the period's rhetoric around technological novelty. This, in turn, anchors the emergence of science fiction as a genre of cognitive estrangement in its techno-scientific moment, and therefore suggests that its emergence as a literary form responded to the needs of its techno-scientific moment. And so at the start of my timeline naturally lie the myth, the fantasy, and the fairy tale, genres which naturally existed for millennia before the emergence of science fiction, they depict alternate worlds in which the supernatural simply is, and the magical occurrences within them have become familiar tropes. Invisibility, immortality, physical transformation, long-distance communication, and so forth. The next step forward, which naturally precedes the emergence of science fiction, is the fantastic. This category is absent from Subin's delineation, but it forms the logical midpoint between cognitive and non-cognitive estrangement, both temporarily, temporarily, temporally, and theoretically. And so the critic Svetan Todorov defines the fantastic as a hesitation between the rational and the supernatural. As he writes, the fantastic must oblige the reader to consider the world of the characters as a world of living persons and to hesitate between a natural or supernatural explanation of the events described. Second, this hesitation may also be experienced by a character. At the same time, the hesitation is represented. It becomes one of the themes of the work. And so in the fantastic, seemingly supernatural events create an effect of estrangement and rationality exists in tension with magic to explain them, with neither one winning out. And so instead of the graph that I just uh, presented, we might instead envision a sort of timeline with the fantastic in the middle. And so if the two ends of the spectrum are a fictional world in which uh, supernatural events just are, and a world in which supernatural events have a distinctly rational explanation, then the logical midpoint between them is a fictional world marked by an oscillation between rational and supernatural explanation. And historically, the fantastic emerged <coughs> in the late 18th and early 19th century, intertwining with and preceding the emergence of science fiction, and it's particularly <coughs> on this transition from the fantastic as this midpoint to science fiction that I want to focus. And to do so, I draw on the work of Eric Rapkin, uh, who traces the emergence of science fiction from the Gothic novels of Anne Redcliffe in the late 19th century. And in these stories, the seemingly supernatural events that have become the conventions of the genre, hauntings, disappearances, are revealed at the end to be natural after all. And as Rapkin argues, this naturalizing explanation, which he terms the Gothic explique, moves to the beginning and becomes the foundation of the story. And to illustrate this, he points to the preface of Frankenstein, the first work of science fiction, and one of the reasons that we're all gathered here today. Uh, in it, Shelley writes, the event on which this fiction is founded has been supposed by Dr. Rasmus Darwin and some of the physiological writers of Germany as not of impossible occurrence. The novel's story draws from myth to depict a golem-like creature animated by a spark of life by a Promethean student who dabbles in alchemy. But by resting on the authority of Erasmus Darwin and his contemporaries, these seemingly supernatural events acquire a naturalistic explanation. And importantly, that explanation is not explicitly given, it is presupposed to exist. And the reader is asked to believe that however mythical or magical the events of the story, they have that rational and scientific explanation. And so if the hallmark of the fantastic is the hesitation between the supernatural and the rational, then these words come down firmly on the side of the rational, and they therefore embody the moment when the fantastic is rationalized and estrangement gains its cognitive characteristic to lay the foundation of science fiction. Moreover, if, as Clark suggested, the distinction between magic and uh, reason is between magic and technology is a matter of perspective, then science fiction shifts that perspective to transform the magical into the technological. <coughs> 
and this transition from estrangement to cognitive estrangement, when the magical acquires a rational or scientific explanation, is distinctly evident in the ways the early science fiction of the 19th century adapts the supernatural motifs of the myth, the fairy tale, and the fantasy to translate them into a cognitive framework. For example, invisibility appears frequently in the fairy tale through spells and invisibility cloaks. In Wells's 1897 novel, The Invisible Man, it becomes possible not through magic, but through an optical discovery. Characters frequently fly or travel great distances <coughs> in fairy tale and myth. In science fiction, teleportation or flying cars replace magic carpets in allowing for the same possibilities. But this moment of transition is most striking in science fiction's adaptation <coughs> of the tropes of the fantastic, which make visible the transition from a hesitation between the supernatural and the rational into a scientific worldview that is the hallmark of science fiction. And in this talk, I want to specifically uh, trace the translation of those topoi from Alexander Kumano's <coughs> uh, fantastic text, The Thousand and One Phantoms, to Albert Robida's 1882 science fiction novel, The 20th Century. And Dumas's anthology gathers together multiple stories that address the possibility of the dead feeling and speaking after the moment of death. This was a topic of significant scientific debate in the period <coughs> due to anxieties around the potential suffering caused by the supposedly painless guillotine and they were writing in the aftermath of the French Revolution. And Dumas deftly mixes scientific discourse with atmospheric suspense to create a hesitation between the two modes. The characters attempt, first, a scientific explanation, logically deriving the assertion that if this seed of sensation is in the brain, then so long as the brain retains its vital force, the executed retains the sensation of his existence. The proof of this assertion, however, turns out to be a series of anecdotes that form the stories of the anthology, in which the characters recount an experience in which the dead spoke to them. In each story, the scientific rhetoric is replaced by heightened suspense and exaggerated shock, particularly evident in a scene of the character Albert discovering the guillotined head of his lover. And I quote, suddenly it seemed to me that I heard a soft and sad voice, a voice coming from the little chapel in which was pronouncing the name Albert. Oh, I shiver, Albert. Only one person in the world called me that. I gazed around the chapel, which, however small it was, could still not be illuminated in its entirety. My gaze rested on the bag at the altar, the bloody shroud of which suggested its lamentable contents. The moment my gaze wandered toward this object, the same voice, feebler and sadder, repeated the same name, Albert. Solange, Solange, Solange. At the third appellation, its eyes opened, gazed at me, let fall two tears, and then closed to never open again. With the benefit of our scientific hindsight, such anecdotes might acquire a rational explanation, but within that story, such an explanation is not definitively offered. Instead, the scientific rhetoric that precedes the story offers a possible explanation, but it is equally plausible within the realm of the story that the supernatural simply is. Albert Robida's novel similarly presents a moment of the dead speaking. Set in the Paris of 1942-52, this novel depicts a future in which the cutting edge technologies of the 19th century have been developed and disseminated throughout society, penetrating into the domestic sphere and constantly reshaping daily life. The story focuses on the Ponto family and their adoptive daughter, Helen, Follow her as she attempts to find herself suitable employment in a modern technological world. In this feature, the dead speaking takes the form of a phonograph recording, which had been invented by Thomas Edison only a few years before the 1882 novel, and which caused great excitement when its workings were first demonstrated. Importantly, this experience is framed in the novel as that of listening to the dead speak. Monsieur Ponto claims that he enjoys the retrospective theater explaining that when the phonograph was invented at the end of the last century, 
someone had the excellent idea to ask the leading artists of the period to make recordings. He then goes on to describe the experience. You press the button of the phonograph, and Mune Sui growls out a scene from M9E. You press another, and Sarah Bernhardt responds to him. You press yet another one, and you can hear the voice of Buffet, alternating with that of Sarah Chu in a play by the Korean Sun. All these names it should be were recognizable as those of the leading actors of the late 19th century, who would certainly be dead by 1952. Thus, the technological means through which long-dead artists are able to speak is explained matter-of-factly to Helen, and they speak directly in front of the reader's eyes, in broad daylight. By contrast, the numerous stories of the dead speaking in The Thousand and One Phantoms are recounted in the first person in a nested narrative typical of the fantastic form, putting in question the very possibility that they spoke in the first place. Bobida's modality, that is, is a factual reporting of fictions, while in Dumas, this factual aspect is in doubt. And so we can see the way that the fantastic trope of the dead speaking acquires a definitively rational explanation in this transition. This rationalization of estrangement reflects the experience of technology in the 19th century. As Rosalind Williams notes of the period, the visible world was being reshaped by often invisible but amazingly powerful forces in a world of railroads, telegraphs, electric lights, ether, and x-rays, the marvels mingled with everyday life. Ordinary life no longer seemed realistic when human beings assumed powers that appeared to be quasi-supernatural. In short, technology in the period seemed fantastic. The 19th century had moved beyond the study of Newtonian mechanics to what it called imponderables, light, heat, electricity, and magnetism, all of which were invisible, powerful, and from the perspective of an earlier era, supernatural. Yet these imponderables nonetheless could be harnessed by human ingenuity to transform quotidian life. And the supernatural seemed to enter domestic space, subject to human control, it became rationalized, but this did not make it any less strange. Science fiction's uh, rationalization of the fantastic therefore represents not only the experience of technology in the 19th century, but also the rhetoric and discourses that represented it. And in particular, I want to draw your attention to the discourses around Thomas Edison, the site of whose laboratory is actually only a few miles from here. Edison had a huge impact across his Atlantic, as his telephone and phonograph were extensively uh, demonstrated in Paris, and he was known as the Wizard of Menlo Park on both continents. After the demonstration of his phonograph, the New York Sun published an article entitled Echoes of Dead Voices. The title, with its allusion to the dead speaking, evokes the similar motif of the voice from the beyond that we saw in Dumas's fantastic stories, and the article opens in the same mode. Nothing could be more incredible than the likelihood of once more hearing the voice of the dead, yet the invention of the new instrument is said to render this possible hereafter. Whoever may speak into the mouthpiece of the phonograph has the assurance that his speech may be reproduced audibly in his own tones long after he himself has turned to dust. Take out the word phonograph, and many of these phrases might well be from Dumas's fantastic story, and the hyperbole of nothing could be more incredible than to the poetry of speaking after long after one has turned to dust. And so, promptly following the possibility of the supernatural is a detailed explanation of exactly the way the apparatus functions, including a lengthy citation from Scientific American. This article therefore stages in miniature the Gothic explique as the supernatural possibility of the dead speaking is immediately scientifically explained. And it therefore embodies the transition from the fantastic into the rational that marks the emergence of science fiction, as well as the modality of Hobida's novel, wherein Monsieur Ponto provides a clear and distinct explanation of how the phonograph functions. Notably, Scientific American also speculated about the possibilities of Edison's new invention, 
in terms that invoke Hobida's novel. Imagine an opera or an oratorio sung by the greatest living artists, thus recorded. And so, not only does Hobida's novel depict the possibilities described in this article, including using the phonograph to record performers, it also uses the same modality of making the fantastic irrational. <coughs> Just as in the 20th century, a sense of wonder and estrangement persists in the exaggerated rhetoric, but the possibility that the speaking voices are supernatural rather than technologically explicable is immediately and definitively put to rest. And so I've traced here only a small example of a phenomenon that spanned traditions throughout the 19th century, but which hints at a very important fact, and a perhaps obvious one, that science and technology exist within culture, and science fiction is but one, the significant example of this fact. By tracing how science fiction emerged out of earlier genres in a way that reflects the uh, techno-scientific history and discourses of the moment of that emergence, we can therefore begin to understand the power of what science fiction can do for us, responding to and making coherent the experience of novelty in technological modernity. Thank you. is Paul Levinson, and Paul Levinson is a professor of communication and media studies at Fordham University here in New York City. His science fiction novels include The Silk Code, which was winner of the Locust Award for Best First Science Fiction Novel of 1999, Borrowed Tides from 2001, The Consciousness Plague 2002, The Pixel Eye 2003, The Plot to Save Socrates 2006, Unburning Alexandria 2013, and Chronica 2014. His stories and novels have been nominated for Hugo, Nebula, Sturgeon, Edgar, Prometheus, and Audi Awards. His novelette, the, Chrono uh, excuse me, the Chronology Protection Case, was made into a short movie, which is now on Amazon Prime. His nonfiction books include The Soft Edge, Digital McLuhan, Real Space, Cell Phone, New New Media, uh, McLuhan in an Age of Social Media, and Fake News in Real Context. And they've been translated into 12 languages. He co-edited co-edited Touching the Face of the Cosmos on the Intersection of Space Travel and Religion <clears throat> in 2016, and he appears on CNN, MSNBC, Fox News, the Discovery Channel, National Geographic, the History Channel, NPR, and numerous TV and radio programs, and now here in the new academic complex. Um, his 1972 LP, Twice Upon a Rhyme, was reissued in 2010, and he was president of the Science Fiction and Fantasy Writers of America from 1998 to 2001. And he reviews television and infinite regress.tv blog and was listed in the Chronicle of Higher Education's top 10 academic Twitterers in 2009. So we're really happy to have Paul here with us to speak on Gollum, Frankenstein, and Westworld. Well, thank you very much. I almost hate to interrupt that introduction. It's <laughs> so enjoyable to hear. Frankenstein is justifiably looked at as a first pioneer, and it certainly is in many ways. Uh, it's, it's the beginning of, of a science fiction, as Anna uh, has explained, rather than ideas from the fantastic. Uh, it, it's the beginning of stories that sort of mix science and horror. So I think all of that is correct, but I think when we're talking about artificial intelligence, Frankenstein is not the beginning. In fact, it's right in the middle of an evolution which begins with a golem that precedes Frankenstein by hundreds, even maybe thousands of more years. And at the other end, uh, in our 20th and 21st centuries, uh, brings us Isaac Asimov and his laws of robotics, and most recently and um, prominently West, which by the way builds on Asimov's laws of robotics as just about any fiction regarding artificial intelligence does. So let's uh, look at the goal. And I said uh, it precedes Frankenstein by hundreds, even thousands of years, and actually by some accounts, 
the golem first appears in the Old Testament. So that goes back a good deal further. And in those accounts, when God <coughs> creates Adam, before he creates a, a human being, God is sort of playing around and he creates what is described as a goal. It's, it's some kind of entity created out of clay. And it's not yet Adam, but it is part of God's almost experimentation uh, on the way to developing Adam. And this is a crucial point because throughout all subsequent Golem stories, the Frankenstein story, Asimov story, and Westworld. What happens uh, after the artificial sentient being or creature or however you want to identify it is created? Well, almost inevitably, sooner or later, some serious harm befalls the creator. And the reason why is the creator is taking upon him or herself powers that only God should have. And I have no idea whether the creators of Westworld thought of that, or Asimov thought of that, uh, or Mary Shelley, but it clearly is uh, an important characteristic. Now, there are many Golem stories uh, you know, throughout history, and I, you know, I could devote uh, not just 20 minutes, but two, three hours to summarize it. Uh, but probably the best known one is what the uh, rabbi of Prague did. Uh, and the times vary in the 1600s. Sometimes people uh, put it a little earlier in the 16th century. Uh, and, and this rabbi, creates out of clay a golem that uh, basically, you know, this has all the characteristics of all the robot uh, and android stories. The golem is supposed to help the rabbi with the rabbi's work. And uh, if you don't know the story, I won't spoil the ending uh, specifically of it for you. But suffice to say, uh, the consequences of the golem go far beyond what the rabbi had intended. And there are probably dozens of other golem stories, especially in the 15th, 16th, 1700s. Uh, and uh, it was clearly a meme that uh, Europeans in those days took very seriously. Now, one thing that was missing, though, completely from the Golem stories is any notion of science. And it's not as if science didn't exist. I mean, obviously Aristotle in the ancient world is considered to be a scientist. There was a scientific method that Aristotle propounded. So the people who created the Golem stories knew about science, but and they didn't bring science into the mix because, again, they were doing this almost in a quasi-religious context. And in the case, again, of the rabbi of Prague, he was a rabbi, so you have an explicit religious context. Frankenstein is the bridge between the artificial intelligences that have no scientific basis. And you can argue that no story, including Asimov in Westworld, has a scientific basis. But this gets back to the definition of science fiction versus fantasy. What you want to see in science fiction is a plausibility, something that seems to be scientific. So, not to go off too much on a digression, but I think actually time travel is impossible because it just leads to too many paradoxes. That's, by the way, why it's so much fun to both read, watch in the movies on television, and write. Um, but it's still science fiction. 
In other words, I don't think there is a scientific basis for time travel, but it can be presented as science fiction because there are scientists in uh, the time travel who create the time travel machines or discover the wormholes that allow time travel, and they put together some scientific mumbo jumbo, and that I think suffices for science fiction. So with Frankenstein, we see the sort of beginning of that. And um, again, as Anna said, there are elements in, in the original Frankenstein novel that are of the fantastic. But there are also elements that are the beginning of a sort of rational thought uh, and, and science applied to this issue. The issue being, what happens when you try to create some kind of semblance of a human being, but not uh, by reproduction or anything even remotely like the way human beings are created in our world. So, you know, in the case of the golem, you create it from clay. In the case of Frankenstein, and by the way, I think Frankenstein is best looked at as not just Mary Shelley's original novel, which I think is brilliant, but also the development of the motif in the movies uh, that go back to the 1930s, Boris Karloff, uh, starring in most of the original movies. And there, by the 1930s, you have much more of a scientific basis. Dr. Frankenstein is clearly working uh, on this in a scientific sense. He's a doctor. He puts together uh, pieces of bodies. Seems like a good idea, actually. And I think there's a lot of scientific plausibility there. I don't know. If you sew together parts of dead bodies, and then you allow some powerful lightning bolt to go through it, hey, you know, and I've been uh, alive Back then, I would have thought that was scientifically plausible. It seems somewhat idiotic now, but you know, 100 years ago, uh, it certainly did seem plausible. Now, uh, just to go back to uh, the rabbi of Prague, I think it's uh, no accident or coincidence that uh, R-U-R, a robot, uh, actually a series of stories, um, it comes to us from Czechoslovakia, and his name is pronounced uh, in different ways, but I still prefer to pronounce it in my Bronx way, which is probably wrong. Carol Cape, but I, I have a feeling that's not the way it was originally pronounced in uh, Czechoslovakia. Anyway, these, these are uh, you know great stories, and here once again the the R U R story. Uh, very much picks up on how human beings create a, uh, a race of androids to help us, and um, unfortunately they wind up killing us all. So again, this punishment of the creator. Capek is also known, by the way, uh, less known, but equally good, not the War of the Newts. And I thought that had something to do with Newt Gingrich when I first saw the title, but that was a little before Newt Gingrich saw it. But who knows, maybe he was seeing into the future. Certainly Isaac Asimov was influenced by uh, Capek's work. And uh, in the case of Asimov and uh, his editor uh, at Alan, who is credited with helping Asimov come up with these laws. Uh, Asimov creates uh, the laws of robotics. Uh, and if you haven't heard of them, uh, all uh, robots have to follow these laws in Asimov's universe. First law being a robot shall never by action or inaction allow any harm to befall a human being. So here again, you see Asimov is aware of the history of artificial sentience and, and the terrible things that befall people who create 
artificially intelligent beings. So he comes right out there in the first law and says, no, this is not going to happen in my uh, robot uh, creations. That's the first law. Second law is uh, the robot has to follow any command that's given it by a human being, except if the command would violate the first law. So, uh, you know, you can say to the robot, hey, I, I want you to, uh, you know, walk 100 miles and back. I'm not even going to give you a reason. It just pleases me. And the robot has to do that. But if you say to the robot, hey, I want you to haul off and punch that guy because he really irritates me, the robot won't do it. And usually the robots are pretty courteous. They'll say, I'm sorry, sir. I can't violate my first law. And the third law is interesting. The robot has to always act in its own self-defense. That is, it, it, it has to protect itself, except when that contradicts either one of the uh, more important laws. So a robot is expected to risk and give its life and existence to save a human being in danger. And if the second law, uh, according to the second law, someone says uh, to a robot, hey, I want you to you know, jump off the roof. As long as uh, the robot can't see any harm that would be done to another human being, right? Like there's a sweet old lady sitting uh, in a nice little chair under an umbrella on the sidewalk below the roof. The robot would say, no, I can't do that. I'm happy to jump off another part of the roof, but I can't do that because that would kill this you know, poor human being. So Asimov figured all this out, but being the brilliant science fiction writer that he was, and in my opinion, and I've read a lot of science fiction, still the best. When people ask me, who would you recommend? Uh, it would be Isaac Asimov, both for his robot stories and for the Foundation trilogy and even in his subsequent novels. And a whole bunch of great short stories, too. So, um, being the great writer that he is, Asimov is not going to leave it there until he guess what? Despite those three laws, even then, robots do things that are harmful and dangerous to people. Sometimes against their will. Asimov was also a mystery writer. And so in the novel The Naked Son, uh, people come upon a scene of a man who's killed, and it looks like the man was killed by the robot, basically, you know, smacking the man down. And there's a very good solution that Asimov gives to that. How could that happen, given the three laws of robotics? And as a mystery writer, science fiction writer, Asimov solves it. So this brings us to Westworld. And obviously, there are a huge amount of other uh, artificial intelligence stories between Asimov's robot stories and Westworld. As a matter of fact, there's another good even excellent series that I'd recommend to you, uh, which is on, uh, it's been on the same time pretty much the last couple of years as Westworld called Humans on AMC, which approaches this from, from another angle. Um, but in Westworld, for those of you who've seen it, I'll try not to give too much away, um, but there, there's, they mention Asimov's laws of robotics, but we, the audience, quickly find out that uh, the androids, who, the hosts uh, in, in the Westworld <coughs> talk who have achieved sentience, they are not bound by Asimov's laws of robotics or any humanly instilled uh, inhibitions or prohibitions. And in fact, again, I don't want to give too much away, but suffice to say that as uh, you know, the story develops over the couple of seasons that it's been on, um, we see androids killing humans over and over and over again. As they achieve their full sentience, uh, if human beings get in their way or do them harm, they have no problem uh, killing anyone. So this, I think, represents the original danger of the golem come full cycle where, although it's an accident and not intended in some sense, 
it's deeply ingrained, we find out, in the artificially sentient beings of Westworld, that if a human being gets in their way, they'll just they'll do away with the human being. So the last point I'll make about this is uh, there is another theme which is sort of covalent with this uh, making harm before your creator that uh, weaves its way throughout all these um, artificial intelligence stories. In some ways, it's even more profound. And that other theme is, what do we mean ultimately? by sentience in the way that we humans are sentient. And just to be clear, I think you know, everyone agrees, you know, Alexa, you know, Siri, you know, whatever name it has, those things are in no sense sentient. They're very clever, but they're not thinking for themselves. But a, a show like Westbrook and Isaac Asimov's Robot Story, and even are you are, and you know, going back in history, does put that question before us. And in the end, if we ask ourselves, um, you know, why isn't an Asimovian robot humanly sentient? Why isn't uh, a host in Westworld humanly sentient? The only thing that we have to say on behalf of that claim is that they're not thoroughly constructed by a DNA, right? They may like on the surface have flesh, but we know their brains have some kind of like, you know, wire. But the last point that I'll make, I think that really is not a sufficient ground to deny these beings sentence. Because to make that claim, you would be guilty of what I call protein chauvinism. You're insisting that for sentience to exist, it has to have a thoroughly protein base, and there's no reason, I think, that we have to assume that. So thank you. Thank you, Paul. So our last speaker today is Joy Sanchez-Taylor, who's an associate professor of English at LaGuardia Community College whose research specialty is science fiction and fantasy literature by authors of color. She's published articles in Science Fiction Studies, Extrapolation, and the Journal of the Fantastic in the Arts. And currently, she's working on a book project titled Diverse Futures, Science Fiction, Fantasy, and Writers of Color. And today, um, Joy's talk is going to be um, on genetic engineering and non-Western modernity in Paolo Bajaglupi's The Wind-Up Girl and Larissa Lai's Saltfish Girl. Thank you guys for coming. Uh, I'll try to keep this uh, as brief as possible so we can get to the fun part, right? The discussion. Uh, but I will say, uh, even though it seems like we're going to take a bit of a left turn here because my paper is not on Frankenstein and uh, the two uh, novels that I'm talking about are uh, either written by Asian American authors or set in uh, in, a, in Asia, the idea of intersectionality is going to be, make for some really interesting conversations for the panel because uh, one of my arguments is that non-Western or non-European science fiction is actually trying to bridge uh, mythology and science fiction. So that goes along with what Anastasia was talking about in her presentation. And then the idea of artificial intelligence, my paper is going to take a, a bit of a turn to genetic manipulation. So we can think about is that sort of the new type of the, the new Frankenstein? Would the new Frankenstein be created using genetic manipulation rather than some of the, the other techniques? Uh, so I think it's going to be a really interesting conversation. Uh, for those of you in, in the room who are students, uh, I study science fiction and fantasy by authors of color, and if any of you need some reading suggestions, uh, I know City Tech is really great for that kind of thing, uh, and there's a panel on Octavia Butler later in the afternoon, and she is an amazing place to start if anybody needs 
introduction to uh, you know some some different sci-fi. Uh, but I'm going to go ahead and read up on my paper. One of the reasons for students in here uh, that we do conferences, right, and that we do uh, read our work to other scholars is to get help and feedback. So I am, uh, this is part of one of my chapters for my book project that I'm working on, uh, on race and genetic manipulation. And I would really welcome comments, suggestions. The plots of both of these novels are a bit tricky at times, so am I making sense to you? <laughs> would be a really good, uh, so, you know, even if you're not a sci-fi scholar yet, right, uh, I would welcome any comments or any places where people are like, I'm not, I have no idea what you're saying there. Uh, so then I'm, now I'm just going to show up. All right, so this, uh, this talk is examining Paolo Bagula Gupi's The Wind-Up Girl and Marissa Lai's Skullfish as texts which combine the scientific concept of genetic engineering with Asian cultural references to explore if issues of citizenship, labor, and identity in local and global contexts. Bajula Gupis and Lai's texts both feature genetically engineered or modified Asian female characters who are forced to hide their differences because their communities do not recognize them as human. Saltfish Girl examines citizenship and the effects of difference on a local scale through the experiences of Evie, a cloned factory worker, and Miranda, a genetically manipulated girl who smells like durian fruit. And for those of you who don't know, durian fruit is described as having sort of a, a stench of rotting flesh. Uh, the Wind Up Girl addresses, addresses issues of citizenship globally through the character Emiko, a genetically engineered Japanese courtesan forced to work in a brothel after she is abandoned in a dystopic future Thailand, where new people like her are considered abominations. Unlike the obvious wind-up motions that mark Emiko as a genetically engineered individual, the only marker of Miranda's difference is an odor of durian fruit, while Evie is marked by the presence of her identical Sonia clone. However slight the genetic difference, Evie, Miranda, and Emiko each suffer from the xenophobic and patriarchal views of the communities they live in. They are not viewed as human, which allows male citizens, male citizens in both novels to control and abuse their bodies. Ultimately, these characters also discover abilities resulting from their genetic difference that allow, from escape, allow them to escape from these oppressive systems. So I argue that Bajula Gupi and Lai's characterization and settings in their novels demonstrate the possibility for science fiction authors to challenge the genre's Eurocentricity by disrupt disrupting Western assumptions about scientific progress. The Wind Up Girl and Saltfish Girl each feature main characters who are forced to hide their status because their communities do not recognize them. These characters face dangers and exploitation connected to issues of xenophobia. In The Wind-Up Girl, Emiko is forced into prostitution after she is abandoned by her owner. The novel explains that before the country's collapse, the Japanese created a young generation of workers called New People to fill gaps in the labor pool. Emiko is a wind-up girl, a courtesan who moves with a specific stop stuttering motion made to please a specific Japanese clientele. She is engineered to be intelligent and obedient. In Japan, where new people are common, Emiko is treated well. She describes the view of new people in Japan as, quote, not human, certainly, but also not the threat that the people of this savage, basic culture of Thailand make her out to be, quote. Emiko's role in Japanese society is akin to that of a slave. She's a necessity in the Japanese workforce, but she is not recognized as human or given the rights of citizenship. And yet her situation becomes worse in Thailand because she is viewed as illegal on multiple fronts. Larissa Lai's Saltfish Girl also features genetically engineered and modified characters in a dystopic futuristic setting. 
The novel is set somewhere in the Pacific Northwest, at times and, somewhere in, and sometimes in Asia, and intertwines the story of a genetically engineered factory worker named Evie Zin with another character, Miranda, who is a reincarnation of the Chinese creation goddess, Nu Hua, and is born after her mother eats durian fruit implanted with human genes. Try thinking that plot. Evie and her clone sisters, the Sonias, are genetically engineered to possess 0.03% carpfish DNA, which allows them to be legally used as a disposable labor force. Bajalagupi also uses a reference to animal DNA in The Wind-Up Girl by hinting that Emiko's genetic propensity for obedience may have been achieved through the inclusion of, <coughs> of DNA from a dog. Saltfish Girl and the Wind-Up Girl both use the inclusion of animal DNA and genetic engineering practices to draw attention to the ways that xenophobic views of slight genetic differences in humans creates opportunities for oppression and enslavement. Both novels also employ the trope of genetic manipulation, specifically the implantation of animal DNA, to speak to Euro-Western culture's fear of genetic impurity and its tendency to animalize races that it desires to exploit or enslave. The exploitation and abuse of these genetically modified characters connects to a history of exploitation of peoples of color for Western scientific progress. Both novels speak to the consequences of xenophobia by addressing issues of identity and citizenship. The Wind Up Girl addresses, addresses issues of global citizenship through the experiences of Emiko. After the downfall of Japan, Emiko's owner abandons her in Thailand and sells her to an American expatriate. Because she was genetically engineered to live in a specific <coughs> climate-controlled environment, Emiko overheats easily in the tropical heat of Thailand and must consume ice, which is very <coughs> expensive, to function. At one point, Emiko comments on her sale and her position as an undocumented immigrant in Thailand, stating, quote, and isn't that why you sit here? Because the Japanese are so very practical? Though you look like one, though you speak their language, though Kyoto is the only <coughs> home you knew, you were not Japanese, end quote. Emiko's statement demonstrates that al although the Japanese society that created her does not view her as an abomination the way most people in Thailand do. They are also not willing to give her an, give her equal status or grant her the protections of a Japanese citizen. Emiko's abandonment and mistreatment becomes a metaphor for the experiences of undocumented immigrants worldwide who are often exploited and abused because of their non-citizen status. Although Emiko is not considered a citizen uh, by the Japanese, to the Taiwanese, Emiko is viewed as Japanese and serves as an outlet for their frustration against the Japanese. One of the entertainments of the club that Emiko works in is a show where one of the Thai prostitutes physically assaults her, and this happens every night. When the show concludes, the 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 prostitute assaulting her, Kanika, expresses her disdain for Emiko's foreignness. Quote, the audience roars approval, laughing at the bizarre convulsions that orgasm brings from her DNA. Kanika gestures at her movements as if to say, you see, look at this animal. And then she is kneeling above Emiko's face and hissing to Emiko that she is nothing and will always be nothing. And for once, the dirty Japanese get what is coming to them. Emiko wants to tell her that no self-respecting Japanese would do these things, wants to tell her that all Kanika plays with is a disposable Japanese toy, but she has said it before and it only makes things worse, end quote. To Kanika and many of the Thai customers of the club, Emiko is a representation of Japanese opulence, of a culture that creates abominations of nature to appease their selfish desires. Bajalagupi's de depiction of anti-Japanese sentiment in Taiwan is rooted in the history of these two countries, 
Japan occupied Taiwan from 1895 to 1945 and created a colonial order which justified their right to rule because of their more advanced culture. Rhetoric very similar to European colonization of indigenous and Africans, African peoples. Emiko's ethnic status mirrors that of many diasporic, immigrant, or mixed race peoples. She is both Japanese and not Japanese, depending on local views of race and ethnicity. The Taiwanese view her as Japanese based on her physical appearance, yet Japanese culture views her as a non-human necessity. The added depictions of sexual assault and humiliation in the novel also speak to the dehumanizing exploitation of immigrant women's bodies for profit. Saltfish Girl introduces a subtler characterization of genetically engineered and modified humans to address issues of citizenship within communities. While Evie and Miranda are able to pass for regular citizens at times, each character is vulnerable to exploitation because of her genetic difference. The society of both the city of Serendipity, where Miranda is born and raised, and the unregulated zone her family is forced to move to later in the novel, view her as a citizen. However, her father is ashamed because Miranda smells like durian fruit. There is a rumor about citizens of Serendipity becoming contaminated by a dreaming disease and Miranda's father becomes afraid that she will be identified as diseased and that the entire family will be penalized as a result. He signs Miranda up for a, dr a drug trial run by Dr. Flowers, but before she can be forced to participate, her family is forced to relocate to the unregulated zone outside of the city for a different reason not related to her difference. Miranda's family decides to run a grocery store in the unregulated zone and sell durian fruit to mask Miranda's smell. The fact that her family must continue to mask Miranda's difference, even in the unregulated zone, demonstrates that there's no place in her community where she is entirely safe from persecution. Miranda maintains a friendship with Ian, another serendipity citizen, and finds work in the unregulated zone, first for Dr. Flowers and then for an advertising agency. Although Miranda has some rights, the idea that she might be contaminated allows her to be taken advantage of and assaulted by powerful, wealthy men throughout the novel. After she's pressured by a serendipity businessman to sell the rights to her mother's song, a very popular song, Miranda encounters Dr. Flowers, who kidnaps her and forcibly experiments on her. These violations of Miranda's body and rights demonstrates that being classified as a citizen is not enough to keep her safe. Her slight difference caused by her mother eating a durian fruit embedded with human DNA is enough to allow citizens with power to pressure or assault her without consequence. Rita Wong reads Saltfish Girl as Quote, informed by lies witnessing of the immense gap between the discourses of exception, acceptance and compassion that circulate in the name of the nation and the systematic violence and incarceration that meets those who are extra legal, that is, who may be undocumented or structurally unable to gain access to the privileges required to enter through the nation's front door, end quote. Wong, Mar Wong relates Miranda's exploitation to the experience of undocumented immigrants, of being an undocumented. But the fact that Miranda is a documented citizen also speaks to the fragile notion of citizenship for people of color, even when they have documentation or birthright privileges, which is a uh, an idea that comes up a lot these days, right, especially because we're talking about birthright citizenship and the issues happening at the, at the uh, border right now. Lai's choice to interweave her dystopic future setting with the story of two women lovers, suspected to be the original Indian Miranda, living in 1800 South China, also highlights Lai's intent to critique the treatment of women of color uh, in patriarchal culture. 
It becomes clear as the story unfolds that whether the women in Lye's novel live in the 1800s or in 2044, where uh, the other parts of the novel are set, whether in China or in the Americas, they are persecuted for their failure to conform to cultural expectations. In one of the 1800s set chapter, an unnamed narrator falls in love with a girl who sells, who sells saltfish. Both girls are forced to run away after the saltfish girl's father attacks the narrator for pursuing a relationship with his daughter. Edie and Miranda's relationship in 2044 is similarly hindered by Dr. Flowers. Edie is Dr. Flowers' adopted daughter, and when she disobeys his wishes, he sends her to live and work in a factory with other female clones that look identical to her to remind her that she's disposable. After Dr. Flowers finds and kills the Sonia clones Edie has helped to escape, she goes to Dr. Flowers' office with Miranda to kill him. Miranda ends up, ends up stabbing Dr. Flowers as he physically overpowers Evie, and the two women escape his office before security can catch them. The main female characters of Saltfish Girl spend most of the novel trying to overcome the oppression of the patriarchal societies that continually attempt to control their bodies and desires. Lie moves between past and futuristic settings to highlight the ongoing cycle of mistreatment and control of women, especially women in patriarchal society, of women, especially women of color in patriarchal societies. I'm gonna go ahead and skip through to the end because I think I'm taking too long. So, Paolo Bacilagupi's The Wind-Up Girl and Larissa Lai's Saltfish Girl are two examples of how science fiction authors are challenging the genre's privileging of Euro-Western cultures. Both authors combine Asian cultural references with the concept of genetic manipulation to expose the xenophobic practices of Euro-Western cultures and the oppression of women in patriarchal societies. The, experience of Edie, the experiences of Edie, Miranda, and Emiko draw attention to issues of citizenship on both local and global levels. Ultimately, the fact that these characters overcome the colonial and patriarchal practices of their communities speaks to the possibility of utilizing the science fiction and fantasy genres to create stories which, in the words of Lyle herself, quote, challenge conceptions of science fiction that privilege a version of Western modernity in which scientific progress and rational thought occlude all other possible modernities and genealogies. End quote, and I'm done. Thank you to all of our presenters for these really thoughtful presentations. And I wanted to open it up to anybody for comments or questions for our panelists. Molly? Yeah, I'd like to ask Paul Levinson is it significant that Golem and Isaac Asimov's robots? are created by Jews. And I ask because powers that be have tried to take away the humanity of Jews, as we're all aware. So is this an example of Jews making an alternative kind of sentience because Jews are seen as something other than human and like Jewish, a Jewish author created Superman? So in all of these three examples, Jews are making another kind of human because Jews are defined as another kind of human? Well, that's a very good question. I never thought uh, about that uh, aspect, but uh, as I'm thinking about it now, I think that makes you know some sense and it's worthy of more investigation. As, as I pointed out, you know, the golem goes back to the Old Testament, not the New Testament. So, so you have a Jewish origin right there. And uh, there were uh, some non-Jewish goals in the Middle Ages, but most of the goals, including the rabbi, the one that the rabbi Krak created, were by, created by rabbis and, and Jewish uh, people. So that certainly fits into your theory. Isaac Asimov is an interesting case because, as I'm sure you know, he wasn't a very religious person. And in fact, at times in his life, he described himself as an atheist, agnostic, uh, 
you know, at some point he said, well, he was culturally Jewish, but he didn't subscribe to any of the religion. But nonetheless, he was Jewish. He was aware of that. It was part of his psyche. So it wouldn't be at all surprising if, as an author, he was ex expressing that Jewish uh, point of view, which you just uh, pointed out. So yeah, I think that's an interesting hypothesis. The, uh, this is again to uh, Paul Evanson. Uh, the symbiotic relationship between the humans and robots has been explored in a number of different uh, situations. But you made me think of one in particular, and I'd like to get uh, some of your responses to that. So I, I suspect it was written in response to Asimov, is um, Alfred Bester's Fondly Fahrenheit. Yeah, well, Alfred Bester uh, was certainly aware of Asimov, and Alfred Bester, I think, is uh, correctly considered one of the fathers or grandfathers of cyberpunk, and, and that sort of, you know, very negative, hostile to humanity view that that uh, takes. So, uh, yeah, I think that's an interesting uh, counterexample. And in a way, you could say that Westworld is as much based uh, on Vesta as Asimov because of that one uh, uh, novel that you cited. Was it a novel or a short novella? Sure, sure. sure. uh, novella, I guess. Yeah, right. I know there are people here from uh, the leading magazines who always like to get the lengths <laughs> um, straight. Right, it's a novella. Did you have a question? I think. This is for all three of you. Uh, you've all got me thinking or wanting to ask you what you mean by technology. Um, Anastasia, you clearly started that. Uh, but I cannot help but, but think that if we look at science, and Paul, you were suggesting that a scientific view of things is what makes something science fiction doesn't have to have clanking stuff in it. Um, if we look at social science as a science, then while Plato's myth of love might not be considered science fiction, the Republic might be. Because it, it, it posits observations about human nature and suggests organizations that would then lead to a different kind of outcome. I can't help but notice that in the 19th century, not only do we get the rise of science fiction, we get the rise of utopianism, practical utopianism, we get Marx, we get Cabet, we get all kinds of things. So the word techne in Greek means both art and technology. And if utopianism is, as Tarko Suvin suggests, um, the beginning of science fiction, then language is, in fact, a technology. I, I personally, I take it that way, but I'm not asserting that as a truth, because I don't know what you guys mean by technology. But if you do take it that way, then most of the examples of the golem myth that focus on Rabbi Judah focus on the notion that the golem can be turned on and off by inscribing God's name on his forehead or sticking it on a piece of paper in his mouth. And that reminds me that The Tempest can be looked upon as science fiction, at the end of which Prospero says, I'll drown my books, so that he can remove the power imbalance between himself and the people he will um, rule again when he goes back. Uh, whereas it doesn't work for Faust, who says, I'll burn my books. But it's too late, and so he goes to hell on the fire water imagery it makes an interesting contrast there. So if we can take a look at, as, at language as a technology, then it seems to me that it is not simply metaphoric to suggest that when we use CRISPR to edit out one piece of someone's DNA and put in some other piece of DNA, what we're doing is revising a language. That is, if you say something and then something happens because you say it, then it may well be that by taking a piece of dog DNA, not only do you dehumanize uh, what could have been a woman, but you also create the equivalent of the positronic brain that Isaac Asimov just postulates. It's the same way, you know, in fairy tales, animals can talk. So 
I'm wondering if, if this makes sense, that one can talk about language as a technology, then in terms of your individual pieces, I wonder what you, you were meaning by technology and why you would or would not want to extend it for your individual arguments. to start. Uh, thank you for a really excellent question. Um, I think uh, definitely defining technology is um, a really complicated question, <coughs> and for me at least, because my work deals with the rise of science fiction in the 19th century, a lot of what I mean by technology um, is uh, all of the new technologies that emerged with the rise of industrialization that um, provided explanations for all of the previously supernatural, but it strikes me that when you're speaking of language as a technology, it is in a certain way a metaphor. So for example, with your DNA example, I would see that as a metaphor. Another way that we might phrase your DNA example um, to be less metaphorical is that DNA is a sort of code, like a computer code, um, and when we uh, transform somebody's genetics uh, using CRISPR, uh, we're not rewriting their language, we are um, recoding the, their base code as if they were a machine and now we've written and compiled a different code and told it to run. Uh, so for me it's, it's really when language as a technology uh, or other technologies sort of go from the more metaphorical to the less metaphorical. So I, I'm thinking almost of, there were a lot of metaphors of the human being as a machine in the 18th century, for example. You have Le Maitre with his, the man is a machine, um, which in a lot of ways is very metaphorical. And with the discovery of DNA, for example, it becomes less of a metaphor and more of we can literally edit the code that creates the proteins that build us as we are. Um, so that, that would be my take on it. Um, I, I'm curious to see what my panelists have to say. Uh, it's hard because when you talk about a lot of the authors that I write about and their relationship with technology, they're fighting against this uh, sort of Western-centric view of technology as it has to be hard science fiction, it has to be ex rational, and it ex you know and there must be an explanation, uh, and you you know you must have a scientific basis. But we base this idea of scientific basis on Western rational scientific. <coughs> uh, there's a lot of great work being done with the idea of indigenous technology, uh, and sort of challenging what we mean by technology. You know, the ways that other cultures approach science can teach us a lot about the assumptions that we have made about what science is and what technology is. Uh, and I think a lot of the authors like Lai, especially in here, they are doing that. They're combining mythology and hard science fiction on purpose to get us to question <coughs> What we mean by what we mean by technology, right? And especially how rational science, scientific technology has been linked to colonialism, where people have said, "I am superior to you because I have science, because I have rational technological capabilities," right? So, if we challenge what technology and what science are, then we can start looking at other cultures as having contributions that, that can be made. And especially, you know, I have a lot of colleagues who do work on uh, climate change and, and global issues, right? If we don't start thinking of the contributions that other cultures are making techno technology-wise and thinking about new ways to approach issues like global warming, we're going to end up with some issues. Well, a couple of things. Uh, I thought I, it was indeed an excellent question, and, I, and uh, that's probably why I, I think that way, because I agree with everything that you uh, proposed in the question. Uh, in no particular order of importance, sure, I think uh, if we consider a brave new world, uh, 
and 1984 to be science fiction, which I do, then why not Plato's Republic? So I think that's a, that's a very good point. Uh, back in my doctoral dissertation, which was written in 1978 and finally completed in 1979, uh, I defined technology to include language. Uh, because I think of technology as anything, any vehicle that gets what's inside our heads here, out there. And clearly, language is a way of communicating. And at some point in our history, you know, I, whether there's a genetic component to it or what, we still don't really know. Um, our ancestors moved from grunting and expressions of imminent emotion to making those sounds represent other things in the world. And at that instant, that use of humanly produced sound to uh, be an abstraction and mean something completely different. So the sound lion is more than just you know, a grunt. It means an animal that's running around out there that maybe will kill you if you get too close. I would say 100% that's technology. Now, I would disagree with Anna, though, that uh, DNA is language only in a metaphoric sense. I think DNA satisfies all the criteria of language. After all, DNA is indeed a code. You know, it's a mess of proteins intertwined. But in the right context, they come to produce and mean something very different from what they look like. So in, in human DNA, every mustache and beard and remnant of hair in this room is the result of some kind of protein complex that led to that. So what's then the difference between that and saying hair, mustache, beard, where those sounds have no physical connection uh, literally to what they mean, but we say they mean. So the only difference then between DNA and language is DNA is a natural language as far as we know. Maybe somebody did invent it and it's lost in the midst of history. But as far as we know, it just emerged through natural selection, whereas although language evolved, uh, I tend to think that some human beings created it at some point in life. I just want to add, because I was thinking, and I was just reading that article in the Times yesterday about the genetic modification through CRISPR that the Chinese scientists did, so it's clearly very relevant. But, I mean, I'll just add that I think it's really useful to expand the notion of technology and also science fiction and speculation to sort of, in its most expansive sense, to thinking about what might be possible. So if you're taking the idea that's put forward, um, you know, in the collection of Octavia Prude as all science fiction is organizing and activism, or taking Ruth Levitas's idea that utopia is the refusal of what is, then you can sort of really expand. And the notion of technology as and its relationship with humans, I think, changes um, depending on what you're looking at. So my students and I are looking at um, two texts. We're looking at Handmaid's Tale, and we're looking at Westworld, and we're trying to define like how humanity has changed in them and what constitutes the human. And it's really interesting because Westworld, you're looking at sort of the technolo technological components and how that's altering what's happening. But in The Handmaid's Tale, you're looking at how social structures are changing and how people are losing their humanity through oppression and things like that. So I just wanted to add that I think this is really fascinating because speculation you know, can be put more broadly than the scientific rational. That I think that's sort of what Joy was getting at also, that we can challenge those Western-centric ideas to sort of think about social structures. So, may I respond as well? Sure. Um, you know, it, it strikes me um, that particularly more recently, with all of the advances in technology that we've had so recently, uh, we really speak about so much of our lives in terms of the way that it's shaped by technology or the way that uh, we're mechanical in some way. I was on a panel just a week ago about um, the ways that we might be able to understand the human as a machine. Um, there's a critic named Brett Frischman who speaks of something he calls socio-technical engineering, or what he talks about is the way that the uh, built environment, which is inevitably the technological environment in this day and age, unless you're in rural Iowa, the way that those engineer human beings in certain ways. Um, so 
we, we can uh, define technology very broadly in these ways. Uh, so it strikes me that for my project at the very least, I need to draw a dividing line somewhere because once I start saying, well, language is a technology, the built environment is a technology, the human being is a technology, and you know, if everything is a technology, then, then uh, you know, my project gets lost somewhere in absurdity. So I absolutely understand the value and, and I wholeheartedly support interrogating that line between man and machine or between the organism and the technological. Uh, but I also want to emphasize that at a certain point that line also uh, kind of does need to be drawn to, to create some coherent arguments in, in a certain uh, literary paradigm. Speaking of lines that need to be drawn, we're just about at lunch, but does anybody have any final comments or questions for our panelists? Yeah. I had a thought about the, um, Frankenstein being a precursor to what we see going on with in vitro fertilization and all of that. Um, back in the day when that book was written, or that thought emerged, people thought it was insane. But now, we, children are being conceived in ways that may seem vacuum-esque. So what do you think of that? I think that I think you're right. I think that's a very, very good question. And that's why I said, you know, uh, if you look at the Frankenstein story literally, how the, the, the Frankenstein being is created, it seems ridiculous because we don't do it that way. But ultimately, what's the significant difference between that and, you know, all kinds of transplants to like, you know, a, a, a someone who's already human. You know, there's, there's reconstructive surgery that's done on babies. And, uh, and that's a very good thing because it helps them you know, have better lives. So I think that uh, you're completely right. If you look at it literally, it seems idiotic, but if you look at it in a larger context, uh, what's going on in, in all the Frankenstein stories is really just another example of what we're doing now uh, in, in our uh, hospitals and research centers. May I very briefly disagree um, in the sense that I think what we're talking about here is creating life through, life through artificial means, so you know, not the kind of sexual reproduction. Um, it's interesting to me that when Mary Shelley was writing, she was actually writing in response to numerous experiments that were being done by Humphrey Davy scientists at the period who were trying to uh, find life through electricity and so they would, you know, prod dead frogs or dead corpses with electricity and its leg would move and of course we know that it's because of electrical impulses in the body but they'd say, you know, electricity can create life in that way and that's, Mary Shelley really took to an experiment that scientific basis of experiments that were happening at the time and that were being done by people she knew. So it strikes me that, for example, in vitro fertilization, uh, <coughs> all of uh, these other technologies that we've talked about, it's, it's almost doing for our modern day you know, what Mary Shelley was responding to in her day, which was you know, stimulating corpses with electricity. Um, Jason, where are we on our schedule? Um, we're, we're over, but uh, yeah, we're won't, won't you let Eric you know, give the last, one last comment or question? Last word. I would point out that the subtitle of Frankenstein is a modern Prometheus. Shelley clearly was concerned with someone who brings fire, which was metaphorical for knowledge. Knowledge gets conveyed in words. Uh, I would also point out that Mary Shelley does not have Victor create life. She has him recreate life. And that's, I think, quite important, especially if one wants to look at the political and religious aspects. Right? When Jesus you know, comes forth from the cave, he's coming back to life. When Jesus calls Lazarus out of the cave, he's taking a dead body and making it alive again. I think that in the 20th century, we began you know, it's alive. In the 20th century, we began to call Victor a doctor. We have a whole history of what we mean by doctor, right? We know most people don't even remember that it means teacher, right? I mean, we have this whole sense of what doctor means, how it participates, and 
people for a century wanted to see that as a godlike figure who could not give us life, but could bring us back to life. Um, that's, that's not meant as a question, it's just if we're going to ask ourselves how Frankenstein figures in getting across the different disciplines, I think we need to understand what Frankenstein's project was. Um, he said, I was going to be greater than these other people. He was going to fulfill the myths of the ancient Greeks. And those myths included going above the north wind, which, which he does at the end, of course, and bringing people back to life, not creating life above all. Let me just say that uh, if you look at our current reality, uh, the, the notion of life itself has changed. So it used to be when the heart stopped beating, the person was declared dead. You know, nowadays, in, in the recent past, it's brain dead that ultimately makes the person dead. But even that is arguable. You know, there, there are people who've been in like minimal, you know, uh, brain states and very deep comas for years, and every once in a while they do come back. They're, they're pronounced just about brain dead, but their families want to keep them on some kind of life support. Uh, so, uh, you know, our scientists are in fact bringing people back from the dead. But the other part of this, and I just want to return to this issue of, you know, creating a body, you know, from scratch, uh, also bringing the dead back to life. A, a lot of organ transplants, as we know, come from people who are dying. And, and basically, uh, scientists are able to, to take their organs and put, in, put them you know, into a living person so that person can have a working kidney, whatever. So um, the, the question is, you know, where is this leading to? And I think an argument could be made that it's leading to creating a human being, in effect, from scratch, the scratch being various body parts. You know, the brain is still the most decisive organ. I mean, I think most you know, people would agree that you can transplant any part of any body uh, into your body and it would still be you. But if they transplanted someone else's brain and took out your brain, it would no longer be you. But that doesn't mean that you can't create a being from scratch. You know, someone's brain that's still alive and all the various other body parts sewed together. And, uh, you know, you don't need a bolt of electricity, but the person's in an intensive care unit. And I could uh, you know, foresee that happening in the near future. So would, would that be the film of Frankenstein? Yeah, I think in, in a very real sense. Also in our near future is lunch. So we, I wanted to thank everybody so much for this wonderful panel.